Okay. Well, welcome everyone today. Um, we are so honored to be able to have the Reverend Dr. Wu Young Lee with us for this um, last installment of the W Star Speaks for this academic year. Um, so first I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Ashley Bachi. I'm the WSR faculty chair for this year um, and the GTU WSR Women's Studies and Religion Certificate Program is open to GTU students. Uh, we have one core course, um, the WSR seminar that's taught every year. You take that course in addition to uh, three other courses and then um, come to a series of events. For instance, this event counts for um, co-curricular units and um, you get a certificate that's um, notated on your transcript. So um, our program is inclusive um, and we hope that if you are a GTU student that you will consider in, um, turning in an intent to enroll form so that you can know about all of our wonderful events and, um, and the courses that are focused on women's studies and religion. So the reason that we have this series, WS, we started this series, WSR Speaks, this academic year, and we've had one event a month since um, November when we began. And um, it's, a, it's a space to open a, just a conversation about um, women in the field that are working on really fascinating topics so that we can just um, learn from them in a, um, in a, you know, a relaxed manner. So not a formal lecture, um, but just a conversation. So the first half of the event, I will be asking the Reverend Dr. Um, Lee some questions, three questions. And then the second half we open for, um, for Q&A. So um, please feel free to put any questions that you have as we're talking in the chat and we'll get to those. And then um, also for you to um, ask questions in the second half. So this is really meant to be um, a conversation, um, an informal conversation. All right, so with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to the Reverend Dr. Bu Young Lee. She is the Senior Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty and Professor of Practical Theology at ILIF School of Theology in Denver, Colorado. She is the um, president of the Religious Education Association of, and program chair of the 2021 REA conference, which centered on gender, sexuality, and wholeness in religious education. She is also one of the founding faculty members of the 2006 charter for our WSR certificate program when she worked here at PSR. And so we would just wholeheartedly like, like to thank you for being a part of the founding of this, um, of this certificate program, which has been so influential for myself, as well as so many other students and faculty at the GTU. So thank you for being here. And also thank you for all of your work, um, both to this program specifically and um, to the wider world for all that you do. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> uh, it's a wonderful to be at home. Let me put it that way. Um, um, GTO is a really significant place um, and space for my own formation also as a scholar and practitioner and a teacher. We're so glad to have you back um, for this conversation and for you to share your wisdom with us. So um, we open all of our WSR Speaks um, events with the first question is the same for everyone, which is what are your thoughts on the continued importance of women's studies and religion more broadly in this particular time? Um, a heightened political and cultural um, kind of polarized climate, racism, a global pandemic, global warming, and now even the potential um, nuclear threat as tensions rise with Russia and um, the atrocities that are happening in Ukraine, as well as um, many atrocities that are happening across the world. From your perspective as a scholar, pastor, and administrator, um, yeah, if you'd like to share. This. I think it's even more important than ever. Uh, so it's, uh, let's look at you know, all of those uh, uh, areas of uh, injustices and uh, oppressions and uh, concerns uh, in global context. Uh, who are the uh, most, uh, the biggest victims? It's mostly women, particularly women uh, of a BIPOC uh, people, you know, women and uh, poor women, 
uh, uh, poor women in underdeveloped countries, uh, women of countries with with authoritarian regime. And also, let's look at you know uh, we live in a country that is clearly uh, saying that separation of a church and the state, but the, the biggest impact that uh, is um, influencing a policy uh, making is a, a very conservative interpretation of the uh, Christian scripture uh, that the Christian uh, supersessionism um, and and Eurocentric uh, I think Christianity. And uh, which, is, which is very exclusive is making a lot of impact on our even policies. Um, so it is even more important than ever. And you know, so in a global context, and as you know, I'm a, I am a Korean American, and Korea just got uh, you know elected a new president who will uh, come to the um, position in May, and the first promise uh, as a pre presidential candidate uh, he made was uh, get, getting rid of a, a government department, Ministry of Women and Family Affairs. That was the first thing. He didn't even say a word on just uh, Twitter uh, that he just posted uh, uh, getting rid of uh, Women's and Family Affairs Department from the government. And then when, when he was interviewed, uh, he, uh, during, I, I guess, a, a debate, uh, he said that there is no structural discriminations against women. It's all about individual uh, thing. Um, so uh, as a, someone who fought really hard for Korea's democratization movement in 80s, uh, when uh, we were under military dictators and classmates were um, arrested and uh, secret police uh, pretending to be students uh, being in the same classroom. So therefore we wouldn't know which one is real student, which one is not. And having gone through that period uh, in 80s uh, and then uh, now seeing what's happening there uh, in terms of a human rights violation, uh, you know, uh, the, the democratic principles are not respected. Although, you know, this current uh, progressive government made a lot of uh, mistakes that that's why they lost, but the, it's just, just a one point, less than 1% margin uh, victory of a, a conservative, conservative party with a candidate that, that doesn't have any political experience, uh, whose mindset is clearly in 1970s, even not even 80s got elected. And so we know, you know, uh, uh, leaders like that are, are have been uh, elected throughout the uh, world. So women and religion are even more so important. However, uh, as I said earlier, you know, typically uh, uh, for, for, long, for long, long time, either feminist movement or women and religion movement have been very much based on uh, white middle class uh, uh, cisgender uh, experience. And, but that will not work. That will not work because uh, it really speaks to the majority of uh, women. Uh, uh, you know, it, it doesn't speak to a majority of women, including myself. And also, you know, uh, knowing uh, the global oppressions uh, that is uh, also domestic oppression, our local oppression is uh, so uh, intertwined and tangled together in this neoliberal global uh, market driven world. If women and religion are just uh, staying in academy or if the women and religion program are uh, not, uh, you know, uh, not only just uh, paying attention to, but, but not uh, having, um, race consciousness, especially this anti-black racism era that is a very co-constitutive with uh, white settler colonialism and uh, Asian American hate crimes against the, uh, Asian Americans and then the, uh, the ongoing uh, discriminations uh, along south of the border and all of these issues. But if uh, uh, women and religion, um, any women and religion uh, studies do not pay attention to lived experiences of these people that it it uh, it will not have a much audience. It will not have a much impact and a much power, and also um, you know climate uh, issues. Uh, that the, the biggest victim of a climate climate uh, crisis are uh, poor people of color, mostly, and especially also women and children. So uh, yes, uh, so I would if I repeat, you know, women and religion uh, is a. Uh, even more needed, but uh, it just cannot be the one that it has been. 
but uh, uh, this really uh, serious uh, work in uh, DEI and climate justice um, and also global solidarity and collaboration um, movement uh, should be its core. Thank you so much. Um, so there's so much to unpack there. And I think that your work is, you know, is focused on trauma and trauma care um, informed pedagogies, um, as well as post-colonial theory. And I'm wondering if you could talk to us about how that all intertwines from your experience in creating a feminist, a, a Korean feminist theology. You know, so Korean, and let me say some, something about Korean feminist theology. So Korean feminist theology uh, is, of course, it is very much um, grounded in lived experiences of a Korean women uh, and uh, multiple different generations. Uh, and so in terms of uh, uh, in theological circle, um, the leader of that movement, uh, I guess two major, um, I guess three major uh, uh, parts. One is uh, the Association of Women Theologians of Korea that was founded 40 years ago. And that includes not only uh, the academic theologians, but also pastors and activists. And they have been also producing a lot of uh, articles and books together. The other one is uh, the uh, Center for uh, Feminist Studies uh, uh, and, and, and in Religion, which is based in Iwa Women's University, which is the largest women's university in the world with over 20,000 women on campus. Um, so they also, that institute has been uh, established um, uh, maybe 40 years too. So they have been uh, producing a lot of uh, 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 resources and also, you know, leaders. And, but also Korean feminism uh, is very much activist oriented ones. So especially uh, women leaders in 1970s and 80s who are deeply involved in Korea's democratization movement particularly women pastors who are committed to uh, the uh, well-being of um, young factory women. So during those days, a lot of uh, young women had to give up on their high school education or even junior high education to support their brother's education, to support their family. So many just only had elementary school education and went to work at factories and 12, 14 hours a day, um, Monday through uh, Saturday, and often uh, without having uh, late, uh, you know, uh, without having any uh, extra uh, compensation, but uh, to meet the deadline of their uh, factories, uh, they would uh, uh, work until midnight. And uh, the space of their uh, work is just uh, crammed in uh, 20 women in like a, a, a size of a living room with uh, um, the, uh, the sewing machines and all, all, all of this. So uh, the uh, Korean women's movement uh, really uh, were uh, the powerful movement were generated by those young factory work of women. And so some of the, uh, the uh, Christian women pastors uh, who worked side by side uh, to provide the pastoral care, they also have become uh, the most uh, powerful advocacy voice because often the university-based uh, women's movement that became uh, so uh, confined in middle-class worldviews, while um, a lot of women, uh, young women, or so poor women are working in, in such con context without having any labor law protections and that their rights um, being protected uh, under dictatorship governments. So, uh, so uh, those three movements um, were coming together. So women in university settings, um, uh, building a theoretical basis uh, uh, in uh, connection to a democratization movement that which they participated, but often in democratization movement led by Minjung movement, led by male leaders, um, uh, they would say, mainly, and I myself experienced that too, uh, that when, whenever we raised the concerns related to women, often answers were, oh, they are, I know, we know they are important, but they are not urgent. So and we need, you know, can't you wait until we achieve a democratization? Uh, democratization? So it's always like a hierarchy of uh, oppressions that always put women's and um, poor people's issues or uh, children's issues at the uh, bottom of the ladder of um, the, the uh, hierarchy of uh, importance. 
so uh, ch 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 challenging uh, uh, such approach uh, in the uh, academy. And also these uh, women activists uh, are leading, um, organizing themselves for their own rights, uh, converging and uh, le leading into labor movement. So, so if you look at you know Korea's uh, the, the labor abuse, it's it's very uh, very uh, um, connected to um, colonial modern day colonialism uh, because. Uh, cheap laborers um, that the multinational uh, European and the American companies are using their cheap laborers to produce, which they are now doing in uh, South America and Central America and the uh, South uh, East Asian countries like Vietnam and uh, Laos and Cambodia and Myanmar. Those, so Korea experienced that. And so um, without uh, paying attention to colonialism, the modern day colonialism, and also um, because Korea was uh, occupied by uh, Japan uh, for 38 years. And so it's a very different dynamics of uh, colonialism that people experienced. So even after independence in 1945, uh, the uh, colonialism never lives because it shapes people's worldviews. So the post-colonial uh, struggle and work uh, had to be done. And, and, and also, uh, Militarization of Asia by uh, U.S. Uh, strong presence of U.S. military in Korean Peninsula that is very much uh, entangled with uh, mig uh, migration and immigration of Korean people to this country um, is also another big part. So military militarization, uh, neoliberal global market, and also modern day uh, colonialism is all uh, playing out in Korean Peninsula and often uh, Korea's military dictators wouldn't survive it without a US government's uh, support. And so, uh, because it serves the US government, US interest of, uh, the foremost and, and therefore human rights violations, uh, you know, even though it's named, but that, uh, the, uh, uh, it, you know, people will close their eyes and as if they're like, pretending. And often the biggest victims uh, would be women. So um, my, uh, my post-colonial um, approach to theology coming uh, out of the context where I grew up, but also being a woman of color in this uh, uh, country that is uh, also layered uh, uh, um, oppression called the racism uh, is added and then now, uh, you know, I just cannot uh, identify my, uh, uh, myself as only woman of color experience oppression in this uh, context because I also, uh, as you called my title, I have also a lot of power and, and also privileges that my colleagues in Korea uh, doesn't have. So it's, uh, that leads me to do transnational work, the transcontinental work, because what we, what's happening here, it has also serious impact on Korea, and uh, and and so in during these um, uh, entangled the transnational uh, uh, post-colonial uh, work, um, and so uh, trauma, uh, you know, created a, uh, during Japanese occupation, during military uh, dictatorship, during immigration process, living in this country, and also uh, this. Trans-Pacific uh, trans uh, militarization uh, by U.S. government, uh, and therefore women uh, being in uh, sex industries to support their family. It's all the trauma generating, uh, causing uh, experiences that uh, not many people talk about. So even though my context of these days is in uh, like a U.S. Uh, theological education, uh, but if I don't uh, pay attention to um, that my uh, theology is so separated from the reality. And, but, uh, you know, even in a real US context alone, um, you know, people coming to theological school uh, based on our data, um, almost like uh, over two thirds of uh, Americans have been uh, exposed or experienced uh, uh, some sort of a violence. Uh, that uh, and sometimes we are not aware, but uh, when we uh, are in a context like a pastoral care class, uh, suddenly so some people are triggered to have uh, their um, trauma, trauma um, uh, memories that they have suppressed and coming out. 
So trauma-informed pedagogy is not only sexual violence or war-related violence, racial violence, but it is, you know, uh, something that uh, pretty much everyone in higher education lives with and also happening in higher education uh, context. So um, I, I, I guess, you know, long answer to your uh, question. Uh, all of these are so uh, correlated, co-constitutive, that we just cannot separate one from another. Exactly, that intersectionality um, that you're pulling out. Yeah. I'm wondering, um, in your work, how, um, if you could give us some examples of successful bridge building that you've made um, in so that your theology and your trauma-informed pedagogies, they connect with um, all of these different segments of communities that, um, as you noted, you're in a um, in this position of power versus while you're speaking and um, speaking to and about um, people that are very immersed within the day-to-day -day struggle of the labor movement and all of these other um, kind of intersecting oppressions. And so um, how have you been able to bridge that conversation so that there's respect on both ends and, um, and you can create something that's living and relatable? Um, let me answer that uh, with an example. So one of the um, classes I teach at ILF is uh, women and theologies from the global south. So this is like a women and religion uh, type of a class, but 100% uh, uh, literature is from the global south. Um, so in that class, um, um, you know, uh, we spend about um, three, four weeks uh, with uh, issues from uh, 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 South America and also another uh, big chunk of time from uh, work of uh, Asian feminist theologians and, and another week uh, African theologians and another uh, uh, several weeks uh, with um, the, what we call fourth word, which is um, the communities in uh, North America that is, uh, you know, BIPOC communities, uh, women's work are very, uh, also not uh, highly regarded in mainstream uh, uh, academia. And so uh, often, you know, um, students who are in the class are coming from me and saying that, oh, you know, when they challenge their faculty in other classes that why do you not include uh, women of color's work? Why not include, you know, uh, work of, from that kind, this kind, that all often uh, are very well intended a liberal progressive uh, uh, theologian colleagues, uh, you know, we don't have enough resources, uh, the readings that, that we could include. And so, uh, so as a dean, I was uh, sick and tired of uh, uh, hearing that. So I, okay, I said, you know, I'm gonna uh, create class that's completely based on uh, Global South literature and what a progressive, amazing and powerful work uh, uh, women theologians from uh, all over the world are doing. And so um, in that class, um, not only resources are from all over the world, but often we start with a devotion uh, because it's, a, uh, you know, often literature. And then I also often utilize uh, YouTube videos of my colleagues' work and like uh, Sister Mary John Mananjan in the Philippines. Uh, she is a, a leader in human rights uh, movement uh, and the, one of the uh, you know, pioneers in Asian feminist theology. She has a, a TV channel called uh, Nonsense. <laughs> She's a Catholic nun. So Nonsense. Um, so it was showing uh, those videos and, uh, and, and having uh, students read, uh, you know, Marcella Arthaus uh, read work and Kwak Puyan's work, of course, and, you know, but uh, also other, um, like a women activist in Muslim countries in Asia, like a Malaysia on queer issues. And, and also concerned the circle of, uh, uh, circle of uh, concerned the uh, African uh, women theologians that have produced uh, over 30 some books together as a community uh, last you know, uh, several decades. So, uh, and then their age uh, work uh, and all that. So some of these uh, readings and videos um, sometimes trigger a lot of a trauma that our students uh, live with, even the context is very different. So, so uh, the class always begins with a uh, ritual, a uh, spiritual practice and students take a turns to share uh, the healing uh, ritual that they uh, found very helpful uh, uh, based on their own uh, context. 
And often uh, artwork and music, uh, those are part of our class. And then uh, depending on the time of this uh, class, uh, eating together uh, is a part of the class, but also but not only eating, but mindful eating, but the, uh, the food chain of a global, uh, you know, global food chain that, uh, that how our con small consumption is uh, sometimes um, making, um, we uh, even we are eating at the cost of somebody else's. So, so uh, those are all uh, part of the class. And so as we spend, uh, you know, 10 weeks, 15 weeks uh, uh, and together, um, at the end of the day, you know, I, I guess simple uh, conclusion that we often arrive is how critical it is for us to do solidarity, global solidarity movement. So, uh, you know, another example is that in 20, um, 16, uh, when I was still at P PSR, I uh, led an uh, immersive learning uh, journey to Colombia uh, with uh, 15 students from PSR Changemaker Fellows and, and mostly, mostly Afro-Colombians uh, who have been living there uh, for 400 years, and, but uh, um, they have been displaced, uh, displaced um, multiple times and uh, some witness that their loved ones being killed by paramilitaries, uh, either by global north um, um, multinational companies like a Coca-Cola, uh, Chiquita Bananas, uh, United Fruits, uh, Del Monte. Um, that you know, we things we consume every day in even our very progressive PSR cafeteria, and but uh, then you know we would drink a cup of you know like a drink a Dasani water, um, but uh, these uh, displaced the Afro-Colombian people whose livelihood is, uh, you know, in on constant uh, threat, uh, living on a desert in a tent uh, under 130 degree, even at 8 a.m. And, but they, uh, their uh, access to water got blocked by Coca-Cola. So they have to pay Coca-Cola money to buy water in a literally plastic bags. So, if we are not conscious of our global solidarity, we are uh, contributing to the, you know, the misery and oppression of our brothers and sisters. Um, uh, and so, so this global solidarity movement is not an option, uh, but, but a must. And so, uh, so these um, through rituals, uh, through this global consciousness, so then we come up you know, you know, students each uh, and as a class, um, Come up with what is a, what can be a solidarity uh, action that we can take as a class. So uh, through that class work, uh, we were uh, you know because I was maintaining my relationship with uh, those communities. Uh, that sometimes uh, what they uh, need in Colombia when they are in the threat of a displacement, someone needs to call U.S. embassy there, and U.S. embassy can exercise their power to stop that. So our students were able to do that. You know. So even you know uh, with uh, these uh, geographic uh, differences, so um, so action oriented and ritual, and that 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 you know our text is not only that the written words, but lived experiences of people's uh, lives and also artwork and musics uh, that they created, and then our action uh, in solidarity movement. Thank you so much. Yeah, I. The I I've found I've had conversations with people as well that are like, well, I would incorporate um, these other voices, but there's nothing there. And I'm like, have you looked recently? Because <laughs> there is plenty there. Like when was the last time you did like an actual library search? Because <laughs> um, there's there's so much material. And I think that it's it's so rooted in and these biases and ways in which we, a lot of us were trained within the academy of thinking that, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's no voices speaking from this um, tradition except our voices imposed upon it. And, um, and thank goodness that's, that's not the case. I love when I'm creating a syllabus that there's so many, um, so many options for me to be able to choose from now to incorporate voices. Um, and also the action piece, such a such an amazing piece, because so often we feel that um, there is nothing that we're like we're outsiders looking in, and that there's nothing that we can do. And there is, there are ways in which we can leverage the power that we have um, sometimes as outsiders um, to be helping, um, and and really using that power as as you know being in the U.S. Sometimes calling an embassy, calling our um, calling our legislators, both on like city, county, state, 
um, and all our elected officials to say that this is a priority for us, that that is power um, and we can bring that out. So thank you. So I'm gonna open it now for um, the Q&A from the audience. So if anybody has any um, questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or put it in the chat and we'll read it for you if that's something that you would prefer. Um, I have a, a follow-up question. Um, I have, I've been so inspired by your work on um, trauma-informed pedagogy. I, I read every piece that you come out as it helps me, it's helped me so much in, in creating my own um, pedagogical um, techniques. And um, I'm wondering where, um, where you feel like you get the most inspiration. So um, when you started on this path of um, really integrating trauma-informed pedagogy in with religious studies, um, were you looking, for example, at medical resources? That's something that I do sometimes, um, you know, looking at addiction studies and things like that to pull, um, you know, or sometimes I look at, um, at therapy, you know, psycho psychological um, articles. And so I'm just wondering where your um, inspiration as somebody that's really been um, integral in creating this wider discussion around theological education and trauma-informed care. Yes, uh, yes, you know, social work has done amazing work. You know, also um, the subfield of education, the trauma-informed education have done a lot more work than the ideologians. And pastoral and spiritual care uh, 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 field uh, that I happen to be uh, at a school uh, with uh, some of the great uh, leaders in moral uh, injury work. So they have been very helpful. And, uh, um, and of course, you know, uh, government uh, provides a lot of data and also in the tips uh, that, you know, sometimes the government does good work. Um, so, so there are, you know, so this trauma-informed pedagogy work um, really pushes me to be very transdisciplinary, beyond interdisciplinary, but the transdisciplinary, uh, because other field has done a lot of work. But uh, at the same time, when you know, I'm, uh, if you Google me, uh, I am now affiliated a faculty with the uh, University of California Riverside because I'm part of their religion and sexual abuse project. And when I talk with the colleagues who do the work in non-theological context, um, I also see a huge missing hole there that uh, you know, they are not paying attention to a spiritual dimension uh, of this uh, trauma-informed work, trauma work. And, but you know, if you, we if, who are in religious and uh, theological studies uh, know that how uh, critical that the spiritual dimension is in people's formation, but often colleagues in uh, a quote unquote secular fields, it doesn't occur to them, although all, often they do yoga and other spiritual practices from themselves. So I think I, I really you know, see that the huge hole that the theologians and religion scholars uh, uh, can uh, fill in and also, uh, you know, uh, really make uh, that work uh, even stronger. Thank you. Dr. Lee, could you please expand a little bit more on transdisciplinary? Like, um, how can that all come together? Yes. So, um, <laughs> you know, we understand, and you know, I know that I, I was one of the creators of a GTU's interdisciplinary seminar. <laughs> uh, and when uh, someone starts a PhD, and then I left that the first year it is implemented, uh, but that comes out of a uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, area before that the Valerie was also part of. Uh, uh, so we, we worked hard in that area. And so we know how interdisciplinary uh, works. But often, you know, in interdisciplinary studies, in, especially in theological and religious studies, so within the larger field of theological religious studies, uh, we incorporate with uh, other uh, like ethics and religious education or biblical studies and spirituality. But the transdisciplinary uh, studies is, a, is a really going beyond the theological and religious studies uh, realm. Um, 
So like, you know, you know in, in terms of a trauma-informed pedagogy, that I have to uh, incorporate a lot of a medical uh, uh, education research, psychological literature and women's studies literature and uh, sexuality studies uh, literature and data. So, um, um, so there are a lot of common uh, uh, thread there, but then it's not necessarily that the, you know, uh, psychologists are paying attention to what uh, theologians do or sexuality uh, studies as scholar pay attention to uh, uh, Christian ethics. Uh, so, uh, so go beyond uh, theological and religious uh, uh, studies, but uh, uh, that there are scholars who do you know, common work or complementary work uh, to our work uh, is a very, I think, enriching uh, in both ways. And then G2 has a great resource uh, right next door. And uh, I used to really kick my uh, doctoral advisors, but that you need to take a courses uh, at GTU's uh, uh, ethnic studies program, or you take a class with the Twin Mina at the, the rhetoric uh, department, which should, the theological students are not necessarily would think as their uh, affiliated field. Um, so, um, Dr. Valerie Miles Trivel um, writes in the chat, good afternoon and welcome to you, Dr. Buyang Lee. Um, can you repeat the organizational networks you mentioned earlier so we can put that in the chat and can students join? Of course, Religious Education Association. Uh, you know, we have uh, this annual conference this year from July 5th through 9th. And this year, uh, we don't charge people to come to our annual meeting. It's a free uh, this year. Wonderful. So it's a, so if you like us, you can uh, be a paying member from next year on. So this year, our program chair is uh, Dr. Patrick Race of F F Forum for Theological Exploration that many doctors tend to work with. And uh, the theme is uh, being a good ancestor. Uh, and uh, you can go to REA page and then read, uh, you know, uh, descriptions and, and you can, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, corporate paper session uh, ended and then we are now, you know, putting together uh, programs, but uh, you can come here and variety of voices. And this is, uh, this started in 1903 uh, um, as a, um, a U.S.-based organization, but now we have a uh, Last year, when I was program chair, we had uh, 12 people uh, zoomed in from Indonesia alone. We had a Pakistani uh, scholar who does a sexuality work, but couldn't share any written work with us in case that he's uh, surveilled by his government. So who was uh, sharing, you know, uh, sexuality education, LGBTQIA work he does in context of uh, Pakistan. We had a uh, women from uh, several women colleagues from um, Turkey presented and South Africa. It's just a, such a diverse voices that uh, we had also in the past, the president that were Muslim women, uh, women and Jewish men and well, Jewish woman. And uh, like the, like a the doc and Wimbley was a one star president and Yolanda Smith, Dr. Yolanda Smith was president. And currently also like a, a executive director of the Wabash Center, Dr. Lynn Westerfield is very also active and so Evelyn Parker and Great, great, amazing, amazing group. Um, Dr. Valerie um, adds a follow-up also for Korean female students. There was a group you mentioned, possibly a global feminist network. You know, there is, uh, I, so I joined, you know, like a Korean association of uh, women theologians. Uh, and so that I get their newsletter and I am aware about what is going on, but uh, uh, I don't think that there is uh, any global like a uh, uh, organization that uh, it's open, but uh, uh, Korean women students also, and a all women of uh, uh, Asian heritage can also uh, participate in what we call Pan Autumn, uh, founded by Jung Hyun Gyeong and Kwak Pui Lan and Rira Nakashima Brock. Let me type. And we uh, have, a, we just had um, 37, 30, it's a 37 year old uh, organization, very like a sister, relationship to the like a womanist group. And this is a uh, women of uh, Asian heritage that we had a 36 annual conference and, and we are going into our 37th year. 
Yes, congratulations to that. Um, other questions? I know, oh, yes, Diane. Um, yes, I just with your background in religious education, along with your background in trauma informed pedagogy, and finding out your um, affiliation to with a Catholic university, as a religious educator myself, and just wondering in the Catholic tradition, what what wisdom or what do you see happening in the country in regards to institutional trauma and dealing with the Catholic uh, clerical abuse scandals? Um, you know, just, just any wisdom on that. Um, I'll give you just an example if spiritual directors that I'm affiliated with recognizing the need for trauma informed training, you know, as far as the directees and the issues that they're coming with. So it's beginning to rise the need for trauma education within the Catholic tradition for all aspects. But I just wondered any wisdom or baby steps or big steps that you see happening. You know, that's a really good question because trauma-informed pedagogy is a really under trauma-informed approach. That uh, you know, and if you look at uh, you know literature and trauma informed approach, because the trauma can be triggered by uh, related to many different issues, and so often we think about trauma informed pedagogy related to sexual violence, but there are a lot other you know violences people experience like a war and even hunger, poverty. Um, so in trauma informed uh, approach, um, a lot of uh, good tips uh, that that institution-wide what should happen so that, that this trauma-informed pedagogy can work, right? So I think, uh, you know, introducing concept itself is a really important uh, first step. Uh, about two months ago, I was invited to do a keynote speech um, to a group of uh, people in Indonesia and 1,200 people came to Zoom, uh, live stream the Zoom. And I was asked to address trauma-informed pedagogy. Um, it, it generated a really you know, good conversations because uh, people did not hear anything, uh, any, this term trauma-informed approach or trauma-informed pedagogy at all. But as now you know, they hear about the definitions, that, that they started making a lot of connections and, 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 and what you know, what should happen, what they are experiencing is really uh, trauma uh, related things. So therefore, uh, as an institution, some because there are many also educators in charge of educational institutions were at the audience that uh, I got a lot of emails, you know, like uh, some foundational literature, those things. So the, uh, I think concept itself is a very foreign to many institutions and leaders. Um, so sorry, I don't have a good wisdom. <laughs> But the, and the concept itself needs to be introduced. Yes, no, that's helpful to start with the concept. And that's education itself is educating on, it's, it's a concept yeah. out there and thank you. Dr. Valerie, did you have, a, okay. I have another question. I don't want to dominate the questions though, but it's good to see you, Boyoung, and questions. Good to see you, up. Valerie. <laughs> um, can you, particularly since this group is, is women's studies in religion, can you speak to us um, as a uh, woman who has broken through ceilings in, in leadership and administration, uh, as well as your, as well as your teaching, can you talk to us about um, the path or some tips for those of us who may want to move uh, beyond the classroom in terms of extending our voice into administration or other leadership venues? I, I heard you touch on it in terms of your own work outside of the institution justice work, but what tips would you give us for navigating the- Can you hear me? Academy? Suddenly, I, I, I cannot hear you. Do you hear me? I hear you. Uh, I don't hear you, hold on. Can you hear us now? Okay, now I, I think now I hear you. Okay. Okay, great. 
uh, this is computer, you know, with the wearing this of Bluetooth. Oh, oh, sometimes point. the sound deadening Bluetooth will will yeah. block your sound. So so the last part of that was what tips can you give us for navigating the, the academy, particularly <laughs> moving into leadership ranks? You know, I don't know whether I have a good answer to that because I never planned to be an administrator, but that's, uh, something called me to be in this position. But one thing that I always uh, cherished uh, uh, was do not invest uh, yourself in, in, in the institution, but invest in people that you can work with. And I think that's what I did because, uh, you know, whenever uh, the, the day of my tenure was announced in 2007, um, including Arthur Holder, uh, a uh, few people told me that I should be an academic dean on my tenure announcement day. I said, I, I, are you crazy? <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, being aware of a possibility of uh, uh, being administrator uh, was there, but I never intended. And I used to say that why on earth any sane person wants that job and what was used to be my answer. But because I always uh, in, invested in people, and building relationship. Um, I think uh, those relationship really um, pointed me to different possibility of uh, work I can do as an administrator rather than being an administrator per se. And so uh, like my you know, call for ordained ministry that came from community first and then I took seriously and then uh, it was like a God uh, confirming experience that I had. So this was also came at first from the community of people I trust uh, that they see. And then I started uh, you know, uh, taking seriously as my life um, context and uh, paths were uh, changing. So I started uh, seeing that as, uh, as a calling. And then uh, as uh, I think the biggest uh, resource uh, that I have as a dean is uh, my relationship, network of relationship. Um, so, you know, I just cannot say enough of uh, how uh, grateful I am for the people that I know, that relationship I built uh, in the last 20 years in academy that they all serve as a, my, one of the biggest resources and supporters, but also go to uh, people rather than uh, things that I can make a work. But I, uh, and these people become, uh, you know, the basic resource uh, foundational uh, approach to make certain things happen. Like uh, one of the things um, that I have been working on and, and now it's uh, you know, almost a success story is uh, our 31 year old faculty salary system that was creating such comparative and non-trusting culture among our faculty because it's such it's designed to compete with one another. And no one is happy, but people are not, you know, happy to uh, have a new changes that uh, because system is working even though some of them don't like it. So, um, it took more than two and a half years, but it's mainly through uh, the uh, relational work that uh, we are implementing new system on June 1st. So, so always remember institution, especially uh, it's uh, in regard to women and women of color, institution can, can kill women. You know, when women are uh, advocate our rights or uh, on behalf of the, of the community speak up first, uh, we are appreciated, but then it becomes why you are so difficult to work, you know, you are a bit difficult person to work with. Why can't you just, you know, go along with what's going on? And then if we continue to voice out, uh, we become, you know, the person who cannot work with others. Therefore, we, you know, uh, need to be, uh, we are either terminated or we, we leave, you know, leave. Um, but once we invest in people we work with, uh, so based on allyshiphood, that that can be uh, life giving, and because it's not an alone journey. Uh, so that's what I want to emphasize. And the skill sets easier to uh, acquire, and there are a lot of programs like uh, women and leadership certificate programs, and uh, financial management skill certificate, human resource certificate programs. So you can gain a lot of uh, skill sets, but uh, I think. Uh, you don't want to be killed by institution. So uh, 
So you, we need to be very smart in a way that we uh, protect uh, ourselves, but also create space for other women to thrive. And that requires really relationship building. Thank you so much. Do we have uh, any other questions from our guests? Kiana, are you raising your hand? Yes, Dr. Lee. Um, thanks again for being here. I would like to ask what authors um, that should we look to read or pay attention to from the global South? You mentioned earlier that how you taught a women in theology course, you know, about women from the global star South. So which, um, who should we look to or be reading or pay attention so there to? Are, there are a lot, you know, also in, in even in global South certain contexts, uh, there are also, you know, first generation, second generation and third generation. So I would pay attention to, uh, circle of concern, the women theologians in, in Africa. You know, as I said, they published over 30 books together as a community. And, uh, and Dr. Like, uh, Musa Dube, who is now in Emory, uh, is very a big part of that. And or, of course, uh, Mercy Amba Odoyue and uh, Teresa Okure, those first such generations. But uh, you know, there are a lot of also newer voices and second and third generations in the circle, uh, although, uh, and it's because they publish in English, it's very easily accessible and they, you can go to their webpage and also find the resources. And in, uh, in Asian feminist theological context, you know, there are a lot of rich resources, but because many of my colleagues in Asia also write in their own native language, but there are some you know, uh, resources available like in Catholic circle, um, women, uh, uh, ecology area in women, they have been uh, writing uh, anthology, including practitioners and activists, uh, and sometimes as a, their response to uh, the Council of Bishops, um, and including uh, sexuality. So like a Sharon, Sharon Bong in Malaysia, and, and she boldly writes about uh, human sexuality, LGBTQIA work, and out of Hong Kong, Rose Wu, W Wu also does that work, and. Uh, and, and also Angela Wai Ching Wong uh, in Hong Kong also has written a lot in English. And, uh, and also if you come to like a penatum, there is like a resource page that uh, we also included those writings. And of course in South America, um, uh, you know, like a, in the first generations, Elsa Thomas and uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, Ar Ar yeah, Marcella, Marcella Arthaus read, um, all in English available and Ivoni Guevara's work, but also, you know, someone like a recent graduate of uh, GTO, like uh, Johanna uh, Junker, um, uh, that who often goes back to Brazil and uh, introduce new work uh, someone to someone like me. Um, and so maybe, you know, one of the things that GTO uh, Women's Studies and Religion can do is uh, building this newer resource uh, page through you know, our network. That's a great idea. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Any um, final questions? So we have time for one more question before we close. Well, I, um, I have so, I always, um, I've been looking forward to this conversation for so long, so I have so, <laughs> a lot of questions. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, close, um, I'll close with one. So I'm curious about what you're uh, working on uh, right now. Um, if you might um, share that with us, just giving us a little um, preview as it were, so we know what's, what's coming up. Yeah, right now I'm uh, I'm co-editing a book called uh, "Embodying Anti-Racism in Asian American Religious Communities" uh, uh, with uh, 14 women of Asian heritage are participating. So, uh, as uh, um, during pandemic, the hate crimes against the AAPI community was heightened, and I also experienced uh, one myself uh, in my neighborhood, uh, and. This is not just the individual work, but we just cannot talk about uh, hate crimes against Asian women in 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 this uh, you know anti-black uh, racism uh, uh, is 
even heightened even uh, that has been going on from the beginning and also uh, white settler colonialism and Islamophobia. So the book has uh, several sections, you know, uh, that the focusing on uh, the anti-Asian uh, uh, American racism section. And the other one is uh, critically analyzing Asian American communities um, response that is uh, can be very problematic uh, as we uh, you know we are not making connection to uh, uh, anti-black racism and, and co-constitutive uh, also settler colonialism and Islamophobia so another section is a solidarity movement so this is a major three parts so I'm editing that book um, uh, so that keeps me busy and another one is uh, that as a part of my uh, work with the UC Riverside the women and uh, religion and sexual abuse, uh, six uh, um, women, uh, the Korean American women, uh, that's many of the, you know their names like Ann Jo and Sue Park and Kristen Hong. Uh, in Chicago, there is a, a mega Korean American church and uh, a lot of sexual violence were done to women by their senior pastor. And uh, they have a, in, the victims created an Instagram page that, that they are continually posting uh, their experiences in, in short uh, sentence way and post and there is over 3000 posts already in that page. So one of our uh, project participants is who is a pastoral care person uh, is consulting that group, but uh, we are, and so six of us uh, actually, actually we are meeting uh, tomorrow evening. Um, Reading all of those posts and trying, we try to create a, a, like a resource uh, material for the church and women um, that, you know, from very basic, how do you identify what sexual abuse and how do you take actions and what are the forms of violences and that include in like a, a power, power uh, you know, misuse and all that. So that's, so we want that uh, book, not just to be an academic book, but available resource, helpful resource for uh, women in the church. Thank you so much. And I do hope that you will let us know when those come out so then we can advertise them on our um, on our listserv um, and, and help support this amazing work because I know that um, our, our community would be really interested in that. Well, yeah. thank you so much for spending this um, hour with us. It was exhilarating and um, can't wait to watch it again. There's so much to unpack there. Um, as always with these WSR Speaks talks, I just love, I just, there's so much to get out of them um, talking to such amazing, um, amazing women. So thank you again. Um, and thank you all for coming. And this will be available on the WSR, the G2 WSR um, YouTube playlist um, afterwards. So we'll send out an email when the link is available. So thank you. Thank you so much.